hard Brexit, for me, I still try and use that principally to talk about if the UK leaves the single market, leaves the EU's single market, and agrees some sort of free trade deal with the EU 27, that might be a Canada-style, a Japan-style free trade deal. And that's quite hard Brexit, because, because although you probably wouldn't have many or even any tariffs on goods, um, you'd have a lot of regulatory barriers and you wouldn't have much access for services. Some economists have estimated in that sort of trade deal you could have as much as a 60% fall in services trade between the UK and the EU27. So for me, that's a hard Brexit, but it's increasingly used now to talk about a no-deal Brexit, a cliff-edge Brexit, and, and so it's almost as if there's types of hard Brexit, or if a free trade deal perhaps is no longer hard. Now, I think a no-deal Brexit, depending how it emerged, would it emerge as no trade deal, but you did do a divorce deal with the EU27, or even talks fell apart so acrimoniously there was no divorce deal, there might be legal things flying as well as a lot of economic and political uncertainty. So we certainly see hard Brexit used now to cover both those broad spectrum, but I, I would for the moment try and keep saying hard Brexit is, is a trade deal that doesn't keep us in the single market. And then on soft Brexit, I think has been predominantly used to talk about the UK staying in the single market. So the sort of Norway option, a European economic area option. Now, of course, in the case of Norway, you've got single market, but you're not part of the customs union. You have your own trade policy, um, but you're also signed up to EFTA, just to complicate things further. So you can set your own trade policy except as, as, as a big Norway, except where you're part of the European free trade area and you've got joint EFTA trade deals. So some people say it's a single market, some people say it's a single market and customs union, and some people suggest if you just had a customs union deal but you weren't in the single market, and Keir Starmer, the Brexit shadow minister, has talked about this occasionally, though that's not Labour's current policy. Um, Labour's policy is, is not entirely clear on Brexit, you could say. Um, so I'm not sure if I would really call a customs union only, union only soft, but it, it does tend to get referred to that way. Um, obviously, Turkey has a, a customs union with the European Union, but it's not the same as the EU's own customs union. No one outside, no country outside the EU has ever been a full part of the EU's customs union as such. So I think this term is used quite glibly in a sense, it's not, it's not obvious to me how or whether you could be a full member of the EU's customs union from, from outside. So, I, But I think normally at the heart of soft Brexit is, is the single market, ex except as I say for the customs union only people. My preference when we talk about a soft Brexit would be a Norway model. So we'd remain a part of the single market, and I have served on the Norway, Iceland, Swiss, Liechtenstein uh, delegation for uh, almost 15 years. I think the option that is open through the EAFTA option that we have gives us the opportunity to still be part of the single market, so important to jobs, so important to our economy, but respect the result and no longer be part of the European Union. The trouble we have with having that option is that we lose all influence. We have no say over decisions that we will have to abide by because if we want to trade with our most important trading bloc, with the 27 countries, we will have to abide by the rules that are set uh, by the European Union. The British government need to get real and be honest with people. What is at stake? And what is at stake are British people's livelihoods, jobs and our economic prosperity. It's a, it's a sad day to see Britain leaving the European Union. It really is. And, and I think that um, I think, you know, we'll come out and then spend the next 20, 25 years wanting to get back into the European Union on terms and conditions that will be nowhere near as good as what we have at the moment. I wouldn't describe it as a hard or a soft break. I think a deal will be done because it's in the interest of everybody for a deal to be done. Now, there'll be aspects of the deal that might not be 
great from our point of view and there'll be aspects of the deal that might not be great from the EU point of view. But the whole point is when you're in a negotiation of this importance, there has to be compromise on both sides. No, neither side is going to get 100% of what they want because the other side will never agree to it. And I, I think some of the concessions already announced by Theresa May or seen by her as concessions was a way of trying to get the EU to respond accordingly. And I think we've seen that at the recent Council meeting where the EU, I think, recognised that um, they really needed to, to change their language, as the UK government did, and they also needed to be a bit more flexible in their approach. So I think a deal will be done, but who knows? The reality may be that um, the deal that we eventually strike is somewhere in the middle. So it's probably best not to see these as, well, either we have a very hard Brexit or a very soft Brexit. Um, but on a scale, I think they're, they're probably the most useful ways of, um, of thinking about um, the two extremes of the position that we may end up with in March 2019. The position as we speak now um, in late 2017, so about sort of 15, 16 months um, before the UK actually formally leaves uh, the European Union, is that we don't we actually we don't know so within the UK government so even within the cabinet of the UK government there are ministers very influential people in this negotiation process who have almost diametrically opposed opinions to uh, what the deal or lack of deal should look like so there are politicians like Amber Rudd who's currently the Home Secretary who says that leaving the EU without a deal is uh, to quote her unthinkable uh, and there are others in the same cabinet, in the same government, like Liam Fox, who is the International Trade Secretary, who um, is very comfortable about leaving the EU without um, any deal. I think we're, we're going to see a shift in the early part of 2018 in, in, in the economics and politics of the debate. And given that we've got a minority government propped up by the DUP, I don't see a smooth landing path, if you like, through to next autumn when there's a deal and then Westminster votes on it or rejects it or the Lib Dems succeed in their call for a second EU referendum. I think it's going to be very unstable, partly because of the economics. You couldn't rule out there being suddenly a snap general election if the government falls. At this point in autumn 2017, we're more likely to get to a deal by next autumn than to the catastrophic no deal scenario, um, there's people who, who say no deal is more likely. I think a deal is more likely in the sense of an exit deal and an outline of the desired trade deal, but it won't be a trade deal, that will take several years. I also think there's a chance still of no Brexit. I'd put that at the kind of 10 to 20% level at the moment. That's going to depend on if there's a snap general election, how bad the economics gets, what happens to Labour's position. It doesn't look at the moment like Jeremy Corbyn's going to change that, but if it got into a period of considerable economic and political turmoil, might he change if public opinion changed? So I, I think we're, we're heading into a year of uncertainty.